Hello. Hello and happy Friday to everybody out there. I hope you're having a very fantastic and productive week. Um, uh, welcome to the Biokinetic Canine. Today we are talking about canine drive. Not quite driving a car, but what is canine drive and do you know the risks of that drive with your dog? It's going to be an interesting uh, topic, um, but let's get started. I am Angela Ahern. I'm a certified canine athlete specialist and canine myofascial release practitioner. Love my job, by the way. Um, and I'm going to be talking about this canine drive. Just a bit of um, information. If you are any seeing me anywhere besides our page, the Biokinetic Canine, um, and you need to know anything or drop me a question, please pop over to our page and drop it there. Um, because I may miss out on any comments that you're placing elsewhere, and I wouldn't want to miss out on those, so I can answer you. So pop onto our Biokinetic Canine page, um, give us a thumbs up for a like if you like us, and share us with somebody you think may benefit from the information. We are here to make everybody better handlers for their dogs. So let's get cracking. Riani, hello, how are you? Thank you for popping by. Who got internet today? <laughs> okay, so let's see. What does it mean when we talk about um, the drive of the dog? What is it? It's a, a word that is commonly used by um, working and performance handlers and trainers. So if, if um, somebody's working with a sport dog or a working dog, they mention this word drive. Um, and a lot of these working and performance dogs, sports dogs, they actually are specifically selected and bred for their um, drive, their high drive. You don't want a dog that's got drive that is too high. You want real workable drive. But what is drive? Well, basically, drive is that desire, that inherent desire in the dog to perform a task, to do a work. Um, you get some people like that where they, they – to enjoy the work, um, that's what makes them really happy. So your sport and working dog is specifically selected and bred by the drive. Uh, so that high drive, that, that desire to perform work, so that when you've got a puppy, that puppy immediately, they, they want to do certain things. But what we do as handlers and as trainers, we um, use that drive, um, that 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 wanting to work, to train them. So high drive um, that they work that they work, it, it it causes them to want to do something so badly that they will actually work and train through any discomfort. That's how high a drive can go, um, and we use various drives for stalking, hunting, hunting down a piece of prey. We use these in our training um, to make those drives even more. At our training, we use those drives and it creates higher drives. So what am I talking about? The training that we use with our dogs means enhancing those drives and increasing those desires to work so that they can do their jobs better and so that we as humans can benefit from that improved job performance, etc. Um, so that that uh, but we use it that that wanting to hunt, that wanting to stalk down something, we use it and we can incorporate it in our training, making those drives even more. So that desire to do the work is even more for our dogs. Angelique, hello, welcome. Welcome to join us here on this Friday. Come and enjoy. So when we're looking at these um, enhanced drives or enhancing these drives in our dog in order to get better performance or workability from our dogs, um, we do this with our training. But in the natural state of things, even wild dogs out there in the wild, they rest between their hunts. And they rest between the hunts to recoup. Uh, not only physically, but also mentally. 
Grant, hello! Wow, look at you guys! Come along! So, they are also recouping mentally. And it, that, it's really important because with this high drive that, that willing to, to complete a job, um, there's, a, there's a physical element. Yes, the dogs are working, they're, they're carrying on, but there's also a, a huge mental component. And when it comes to that mental component, just like human beings, we don't always see those signals of fatigue, especially with a high drive dog. So that mental fatigue for each dog is very different, just like humans. There are different signals that each dog gives. And many times we can't see this. And most of the times when it comes to a high drive dog, we see these things a little bit too late. We'll see it when the dog starts to shut down mentally or he actually gets a injury, a physical injury. But why is it difficult to see those signals of fatigue in a higher drive dog? Most high drive dog owners, <laughs> the handlers, are high drive themselves. And I've seen this in many handlers. They absolutely love working with their dogs. And so they work with their dogs. Their dogs love working, so the dogs work with them. And many handlers um, are unable to see that perspective of allowing rest, but not only for the body, also the mind of the dog. But these signals are not obvious to everyday people with their dogs, and they are really easy to miss. So our high drive handlers need, they, they do, they need the, the help and advice on how to recognize mental fatigue in their dogs and even physical fatigue in their dogs because these high drive dogs they don't show these states easily it's really important um, these dogs will work regardless of their physical state they will carry on working they have very very low self-preservation they just it's almost a small bit of obsessive compulsive they, in, they love working, just like your high competitive handlers. They are also obsessive compulsive to the small areas of working their dog. And so they don't always see these signs of fatigue mentally and physically in their own dogs. And they need help to recognize these, these signals. The whole thing with high drive dogs is that they will do anything to complete the goal. They, uh, your herding dogs, your hunting dogs, your police dogs, your detection dogs. They are trained, take just for your protection dogs, they are trained to carry on looking for that missing person, for that person that is lying in the rubble that's in distress. They, have, they carry on, they are trained to carry on. Um, they will have to continue until they reach their goal. And that can be, oh my word, sometimes in hours. And the, the mental fatigue, the physical fatigue is huge, but they, they, their training involves that end goal, that end prize is so valuable that they place that at a higher value than their own physical discomfort. discomfort. So they will carry on working regardless of an injury. And the result is they, they carry on working through minor injuries, which you know, that's the worst kind of injury to have, is those small little injuries, because nobody picks them up and we keep on pushing our dogs. And similarly now, your high drive dog, they don't show these injuries easily. They don't show pain. So these minor injuries then become a greater injury. And because these dogs, naturally their drive hides their pain, your handlers and vets and trainers cannot rely on obvious pain signals from these dogs. So what happens is they will only see the dogs in pain when it is walking on three legs. It is actually limping. I actually uh, watched a really interesting podcast with Ivan Balabanov, and he was speaking to a scientist who studies the behavior of animals. And here is somebody 
a scientist who's not working with high drive working dogs every day. And he went to go visit his friend who has a high drive working dog. The dog's name was Chaser, mainly because this dog loved to chase things. And he could run around chasing things. I think they, I speak under correction now, but I think they channeled his drive into hunting and chasing. And this scientist watched this dog in awe as he would run all day from the morning. And they only finished because the people were actually tired now at approximately two o'clock in the afternoon. It was lunchtime in any case. And at the lunchtime, they called the dog in. And when the dog came to them, he was limping. And the amazement on the scientist's face of like, he says, wow, this dog, he didn't limp throughout the time he was running around. And only when he had to slow down did he show he was actually in pain. And this is the, the, the reaction to most people that are not involved with high drive dogs. They don't understand how a dog doesn't just show pain. Your a normal companion pet dog will show pain much sooner than a dog that is in drive and he's busy uh, completing a mission. He's got to get to the goal. He's got to get there. It doesn't matter what's happening to his body or what's going around. Him. The, the, the mindset is I must finish the goal. He's been trained to do that. That's how his makeup is. So, but the time is when they are actually limping a three legged dog, when a dog's walking with one foot not touching the ground, that is a serious injury. It is a real serious injury in a high drive dog. Riani, yes, they hide it so well. They do. Now, Riani owns a high drive dog. Oh my word, this dog can go forever. It's actually is awesome. But when he gets injured, you don't know until there's a limp because he works through it. And oh my word, I'm so proud of her because she was actually training and she saw oh, there's something off with him. And the following day, he was going for his regular um, physio and massage and everything because responsible pet owners and they're working with athletes. She's got the whole plan for a dog. And she was able to mention this to that physio and they picked up slight tightness in his shoulder and they were able to sort it out that very same day and it was perfectly fine. So yes, Angelique, you know the dog. He is a perfect example for this. He has serious high drive. Helen, like dancers, they work through, have you seen some of those people, their feet bleed and they still dance. It is exactly the same thing. Sports people, they will carry on with the game. It doesn't matter what's happening. It's that they will pull a muscle. I will tra train through it. My, oh my word, my, I've got goosebumps. My own uncle, if you can believe this, he was a powerlifter and he was in a world championship. It was the final, um, he had to do a deadlift. It was the final one for declaring the winner in this competition. He was in America at the time. And he went onto the platform. Now, you know, when you're doing um, competing in uh, power sports, like uh, powerlifting, you've got three chances to perform an exercise. So he goes onto the platform to perform this deadlift and he bends down and he lifts the weight. And as he does it, he pulls and tears a hamstring. So he drops the weight, gets off the platform, and all he does is he straps his leg. He straps it really tight. And he goes back onto the platform. You've only got, I think, a minute or so to get back on to complete the exercise. And he stands in front of the weight with most of his weight bearing on his good leg, and his other leg, it's just for balance. And he picks up the weight. Long story short is he wins. He becomes a world champion. But the, the point being is they work through the pain. They will sort out the pain afterwards. In the end, he had a torn hamstring and he had 
loads of months of rehab and rest, etc., etc. But he worked through the pain, and the same thing happens with the dogs. Now, with Michael, he made his own decisions, etc. But with the dog, we are the care keepers. We are the advocates. We are the ones responsible for them. We are their team member when we compete. Um, you are the, the, the partner of your dog. So when they are hiding that, that pain, all just to complete that goal, and they've got that small injury which you don't notice, and then suddenly they've got that big injury because they've hidden that pain so much. What do you do? Their pain threshold is much higher. Top athletes' pain threshold is much higher because they, your rugby players, your football players, they're getting bashed all the time. And eventually, yeah, they can take it. It's no problem. To pick up that heavy weight for their powerlifter, it's painful. Injury or no injury, it's hard work. And so they've got a much higher pain threshold. And so your high drive dog ignores this pain threshold. Helen, dancers, that normal practice is painful for their feet, but they carry on. It's exactly the same thing. I actually love that example. Um, and they carry on. It's the same for the dogs. So the small signs of pain is completely ignored by a high drive dog where a normal pet dog would indicate that there's some discomfort, they're not too happy. Like an average person, if I had to just go and play rugby now and get tackled, oh my word, I don't think I would be able to get up off the ground where the next guy gets up, jumps up actually, and carries on. I'd be possibly unconscious on the floor. <laughs> so it's exactly the same with the dogs. And we have to be their advocates. So this is, it's important for a few reasons. People see um, high drive dogs and they watch them perform. They don't understand the amount of training that's going into it and the amount of responsibility of that dog that you have. Um, and oh, they, ju they just want the end result. But to have that dog, there's an enormous amount of work that goes in, not just the training, but a good handler a good handler would have the whole complete package, like I mentioned earlier. You have all your team at hand. You've got your fitness and conditioning, your coaches, your nutrition, your, um, uh, your massage therapy, your physiotherapy. All of those things must be there with you, with your dog. Um, because, especially because these dogs, they don't show the pain. And so you had him. But if you are that handler that um, wants to know how to handle the risk of the high drive dog, how do you reduce that risk? You can avoid a lot of unnecessary risks that these dogs are prone to just because of that drive, that, that lowered pain threshold. And it comes down to, oh my word, educate yourself. Learn how to look and assess your dog's body and how you can assess your dog's performance. Because here, even Riani, she saw that his, right at the end, there was just the slightest tweak in performance. It wasn't quite right. Nobody else saw it. But she knew what a dog is supposed to look like. And so the next day she mentioned it and it was sorted out right there and then and he could carry on as normal. The average person, the average handler um, wouldn't know that there was a small muscle strain that was easily massaged out. They wouldn't know and they would continue to train the next day and then again on the weekend and then carry on and that small strain then starts to tear and build up scar tissue. And that ability to assess your dog early on is the most invaluable 
education to yourself and to your dog that you can ever have. But not only to yourself and to your dog, but that ability to relay to your team, your physios, your veterinarians, and every everybody that is involved in your dog. So educate yourself in these areas, along with how you can protect your dog's body through conditioning. These things don't only benefit your, you, they benefit your vet because you are clearer in your descriptions and it, it helps a bit to zone in because, wow, your dog is not showing that much pain. It's not such a big issue. But it really benefits your dog. It benefits your dog in his normal everyday life. It benefits your dog in his career. And it benefits your dog in having a really happy retirement. That's what we all hope for in the end. So let me see. Helen, you're saying handlers don't warm up their dogs. Even I forget. <gasps> Helen, you don't understand what a poignant statement that is because even I forget. Even I forget. And it is such an important small point for your dog. It is so, so true. That warm-up, uh, it's because your dog just carries on and won't show pain, that warm-up lowers the risk of, of injury thousands of folds. But it not only not only um, brings down the risk of injury, but gets your dog through all of that training. You, like we said earlier, the, the, the whole goal of the high drive dog is to, to get to the end, to, to find that, that missing person, to find that person that's in distress with your search and rescue dogs, with your sports dogs, to go as fast as they can for you, to bite as hard as they can. That's their whole goal. With our high drive dogs, they work so hard in even the smallest things. Everything in their body is working so hard for you. And they need that nice ease into it, that blood flow to get that body working nicely. And when we don't do it, we put the dog on the field and they are instantly working so hard that they get injured. That warm-up, that five to ten minutes of warm-up saves you so much heartache. Um, what else are you guys saying? Oh, so Bob says like she knows her, her dog like it's a piece of her. Oh, that is so true. That is so true. Um, correct warm-up is 100% correct. 100% correct. It is so important and invaluable because a warm-up lasts a long time. If you do a proper warm-up and you're going to trial, and you're not too sure when you're going on. If you do a proper warm-up, that warm-up lasts a long time. And you can get your dog in. And even if it's agility dogs or even flyball dogs, if your flights are quite close, there's a small gap in between and you have to go and train again, those warm-ups can really extend and help you through those trials that are piling up in your dog as to compete all the time. So awesome comments, you guys. This is like, oh. So great, I'm loving it. But that is it. You can reduce your risk when you have a high drive dog if you just educate yourself. You have a responsibility. You are competing. This is your partner. This is your dog. This is, for me, my dog is my life. I, I love them to death. They will lay their lives on the line for me. The least I can do is know what I'm dealing with. That's the least I can do. So I hope that you enjoyed this afternoon's talk. I hope that you learned something. Please find, um, find information about fitness and conditioning. It really looks after your dog. It keeps them safe. It keeps their body safe. If you're doing your sport, you are, you are training in the sport, but also train to keep that body strong and protected, especially from the rigors of the sport. Okay, so if there's any questions, pop them in the comments. If you like today's show, give me a thumbs up. Um, and if you think a friend would benefit from the information and is considering high drive dogs or working with high drive dogs, 
share the information with them. If you need any questions, you are most welcome to email me. If you don't want to put something in the comments, just email me at fit at the biokinetick9.com. You are most welcome to look at our website at the biokinetick9.com and you can see what we do. We do fitness and conditioning for sport dogs. I um, am particularly fond of our strength training and protection sports. I love it to death. And there you go. Rihanna, you are saying cool downs are just as important. That's true because your high drive dog is running at high temperatures. So you, it is very important to get that core temperature down because your core temperature keeps on rising after you train. Okay, so that cool down, yes, it is so important. Helen, you also agree. Cool down is not throwing the ball. Thank you. Yes, it's not throwing the ball. What are you doing when you're throwing the ball? You're calling the dog to grab all those muscles and run. Cooling down is not throwing the ball. 100%. And we all do it. But you know better. So cooling down is not throwing the ball. It, your dog has just been training at 100% and now you're throwing the ball. A high drive dog goes at 100% after the ball. You need to bring that 100% down to, hey, let's have a nice time. Let's just go have take a jog just to bring the heart rate down, just to bring the, the temperature down. That's all that a cool down is, to bring that heart rate down, keep the muscles working so that you get rid of the lactic acid and that the dog can go nicely to rest. If you don't do that proper cool down, there's a buildup on the toxins in the muscles and you get sore muscles and cramps, etc. So 100% Helen, 100%. You don't want to have 100% of um, muscles working in a cool down. You want the muscles to work and lower the exertion in the muscles from 100% down to 60, 50%. That's what you're looking for. Oh my word, I'm so chat at the people that are here this is you guys are so clever i love it so i'm gonna bid you all a very fantastic weekend remember if you like us let me know it's always appreciated all right you guys have a very awesome weekend i'm going to of course put all my information here for you guys to have a look at let me go and show my technical prowess. And I'm going to say good afternoon. Oh, let me take me off. <laughs> Cheers, everybody.